Professor Michalis de Fermos, University of Cambridge, UK. And in this case, the combination is uh, PD is with relativity. And this is a fascinating thing, but it seems that PDEs are very useful in studying the stability of these waves. And I have seen that it also has relations with uh, compressed polar equations. So this is uh, something that he will explain to us. Thank you very much, and please go ahead. So uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you Maybe very much. Maybe you take the microphone in your hand. hand. Right. People have been complaining about me. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this conference for the invitation. It's an honor to speak here. My title is what's written here, the mathematical analysis of, Can you speak up? Sure, of black hole space-times in general relativity. Um, so let me immediately tell you where this talk is going to go, supposedly. So I know that uh, this is a PD section, so not everyone is familiar with the theory of general relativity. So I'm going to begin with a primer on general relativity, and in particular, it's, it's dynamical formulation, that's to say it's an issue of a problem. Uh, this will be the shortest introduction to general relativity you will have ever seen, probably. Uh, so I won't spend more than two slides on it. But hopefully it will be sufficient for understanding the rest of the talk. So uh, this talk is about black holes, and the most direct way to understand what is a black hole is examining a particular special explicit solution to the einstein vacuum equations, equation for double general relativity, namely the Schwarzschild solution. So the first order of business after the, if you want, the primer on general relativity will be to explain the Schwarzschild solution and through that the black hole notion. So black holes pretty complicated and Schwarzschild is pretty complicated as it is, but it turns out that Schwarzschild is just a very special example of an even more complicated family of explicit solutions known as the Kerr family. And in order to really understand the issues uh, surrounding black holes that I want to talk about, we have to come to terms, at least very briefly, with the Kerr family. So that will be the next uh, item of the outline. And uh, from then I'll, I'll talk about the, sort of the two things that will be the main object of this talk. So the first is the question of the stability of these black holes in their exterior. And finally, uh, I guess today it's, a, it's a, a Greek section, at least the first two talks. And in Greece, we always want to know what the inside story is. So I will end with the insights. OK, so that being said, onward to primal and general relativity and dynamics. So here it is, general relativity. For the purpose of this talk, what is it? It's simply the study of Ricci flat Lorentzian four manifolds. That's to say, four manifolds where the metric with a metric which, unlike the Riemannian case, has signature minus plus plus plus. That's a Lorentzian manifold. Which <coughs> satisfy, moreover, the celebrated Einstein vacuum equations. So this is just the, the relation that the Ricci curvature of this metric is zero. So, written explicitly in coordinates, this relation constitutes a nonlinear system of second order partial differential equations for the metric functions g mean e. And in a natural sense, these equations are hyperbolic. So, whereas in Riemannian geometry, these equations would be elliptic, because of the Lorentzian signature, these equations are hyperbolic. So, the simplest solution, the simplest explicit solution of these equations is Minkowski space. That's to say, the manifold is R4. Sometimes we call R3 plus 1 in this context. And the metric is, so we call the coordinates t, x, y, and z. It's minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And of course, the geometry of uh, this metric is precisely what defines special relativity as a theory. And well, general relativity is the Einstein's generalization of this geometry in order to include the physical phenomenon of relativity. Okay. So that's slide one of this introduction. So we all do PDE, so we can all appreciate slide two. So if you want, slide two is the mathematical uh, 
embodiment of the fact that indeed this equation is hyperbolic. It has a well-posed initial value formulation. And uh, this took a long time to be understood correctly, but well, now it's been understood, thanks to Madame Choquet and Bob Gerosh for the global aspects. And uh, in particular, uh, one can state a local well-posedness theorem globalized, or rather maximalized. And this is the sort of fundamental theorem of general relativity. And this just says the following. There is a notion of initial data set for the Einstein equations, which is a three-manifold a Riemannian metric, G bar, think of the metric initially, and what will be a second fundamental form, think of it as the time derivative of the metric initially. And for any such vacuum initial data set, I'm suppressing something important. These actually, to be called a vacuum data set, they have to satisfy certain constraint equations. Let me suppress that. For any such vacuum data set, there exists a unique maximal solution, the initial value problem, for the equations reach equal zero. That's to say there's a four manifold, M4, which is something called globally hyperbolic. This is a notion due to Jean Le Ray, actually, and I'm not going to explain what that means now, but later on in the talk it will appear and I'll explain it. So there exists a unique maximum <coughs> globally hyperbolic <coughs> spacetime satisfying the, the Einstein equations, such that this three manifold uh, is, sits as a three surface. Um, with first and second fundamental form precisely this dot. Okay. So if you want a picture, I don't have a blackboard, but I do have this nice line here. So you can think of this three manifold, two dimension suppressed as this line. Okay, so that's the three manifold. And then there is some non-trivial maximal solution. So think of this as part of this wood, um, which solves the ancient vacuum. So the point about this, so terminology, this so the unique solution of the initial value problem is known as the maximum Cauchy development of the initial data set. And you should think that the, the map uh, from initial data set to this unique maximum object is what allows us in general relativity to talk unambiguously about dynamics. So it took a long time since 1915 to 1969 until there was the right language to talk rationally about dynamics in general relativity. In fact, a lot of confusion in the theory would have been um, uh, would have been bypassed had sort of this notion been available earlier. But now we have it, and you should really think of this as the fundamental uh, sort of theorem of general relativity. It's really the, the theorem that tells us that dynamics makes sense and one can sort of study rationally the theory. So we'll get back to the dynamics of the theory later on in this talk, but uh, anytime you have a physical theory before you talk about sort of qualitative dynamical questions, you first have to get a handle on the most basic explicit solutions of the theory. And, well, the most basic explicit solution of the theory, I've already shown it to you, that's Minkowski's space. The second most basic explicit solution of the theory is already pretty complicated, that's known as Schwarz. So, uh, we turn to this explicit solution, and uh, in particular this will exhibit the black hole mass. So, at first uh, glance, it's not so, so difficult, in fact, Made barely a month after the Einstein equations were discovered. So already, in fact, in, in December 1915, Schwarzschild uh, discovered this first sort of non-trivial uh, solution of Einstein's equations. Actually, it's a one-parameter family of, the, of solutions. I'll call the parameter capital M. You can take all real values, but I'll only consider the case where M is positive. If M is zero, you can easily see that this is just a Minkowski metric. So you can write the solution, here it is. It's not so complicated if you're bored in this talk. You can just spend <coughs> five, 10 minutes computing the Ricci curvature of this expression and um, seeing that it is indeed zero. And as you can see, as is manifest from the way I've written this, this metric is static, that's to say d by dt is a killing field, that's to say nothing depends on t. It's spherically symmetric, that's to say SO3 acts by isometry, or more pedestrianly, if you look at the spherical part of the metric, that's just the usual spherical metric. Um, and in fact, well, that's how this solution was discovered. If you just impose these symmetries and are patient enough with calculation, then well, you'll discover the solution. It's completely algorithmic. So that's the easy part, and that's what Schwarzschild did back then. But the difficult part is the following. So I've told you that this is a solution. I've given you the metric explicitly as a formula in coordinates. But I haven't told you where this metric lives. What is the correct ambient manifold on which 
the metric lifts, because of course the unknown for the Einstein equations, if you will, is the manifold comma the metric. It's the sort of Lorentzian manifold. So this was the much harder question and the one that caused infinite confusion in the theory of general relativity. A confusion that I don't, fortunately we won't have to repeat here, so we can go right to the sort of resolution of that confusion. So in very pedestrian language, the correct thing to do finally, in order to understand this, is to rewrite, so there are some typos in these slides which are because I had to give them in advance always a last minute person. So uh, you rewrite the metric in bounded null coordinates. That's to say coordinates u and v such that the metric takes this form. So you can always do this for spherically symmetric metrics. And you should think that u and v, they uh, range in a two-dimensional space. Okay. So you can write the uh, metric like this. But moreover, and this is very important, you can think of this two-dimensional space as a subset of R2, or even better, as a subset of R2 with the two-dimensional Minkowski metric, okay? the metric minus dt squared plus dx squared. Okay? So uh, and you can identify, if you want, u to be t plus x and v to be t minus x of, I guess that's the opposite convention that I usually use, but it's not so relevant for this, um, for this um, presentation. So you can think of this Q as sitting in two-dimensional Minkowski space, so it's really a subset of uh, two-dimensional Minkowski space, and you think of U and V as, at the same time, null coordinates of this ambient two-dimensional Minkowski space. So the point is that when you think about it like this, this <coughs> two-dimensional metric, as a metric on Q, is conformal to the trivial Minkowski metric on Q. Okay, and that's simply because uh, this is the trivial Minkowski metric in these final coordinates u and v is just minus du dv, that's it, 2 du dv. So uh, it turns out that you can, you can really uh, get a good feeling for the geometry of Schwarzschild uh, simply by understanding the, the causal structure of Q, which is the same as just as a subset of this two-dimensional Minkowski space. If I also tell you a little bit about R, which if you know she is now not a coordinate, but it's a function of uh, u and v. Okay. So this is really the way to see it. And it turns out that the, the, if you want the largest such Q on which the Schwarzschild metric can live, and this is what we now call the Schwarzschild metric, is depicted here. Okay. So this is a subset of the two-plane. Okay. And you should think of this as the sort of uh, where the u and v coordinates are, are valid. Okay. So I'll get back to uh, explaining a little bit the labeling on this picture later on. So just think of this as this funny region, okay, which is bounded by this sort of horizontal space-like line, this null line. Remember, null lines in Lorentzian geometry are lines which are uh, at 45 degrees in, in, in one plus one dimension Minkowski space with the uh, horizontal, this null line, this horizontal line, this horizontal, whatever is inside. So we call this uh, the Penrose diagram of Schwarzschild, and it turns out, and this was the source of the confusion, that these original R and T coordinates that uh, I originally wrote the metric in, uh, you, you can define them in any quadrant here. You can define them here, 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 and here. But they always break down on these two lines. Okay, and in some sense, those two lines are the most important part of the geometry, and hence the confusion. So let me just say one thing about this space-time before explaining anything else about the behavior of this function r, etc. Uh, we can view this space-time dynamically. That's to say, we can view the space-time in the context of the theorem of Madame Chouquet. So in particular, uh, you can draw a line like this, so a line like this, connecting this with that. My hand is not so steady. Um, so a line like that upstairs is a free manifold with topology R cross S2. Okay? And that serves as an initial data set such that the maximal Cauchy development of that data is precisely this picture. Okay? So the Schwarzschild solution, you can think of it as the maximal Cauchy development of what is in fact a complete Cauchy hypersurface with this topology 
and with two asymptotically flat ends. And somehow this and this upstairs are asymptotically flat ends. Okay, let me say a few more words about the geometry, in particular about what these labelings mean. So I said that there are two things to read off here, just the causal structure of this subset of the ambient R2. But at the same time, the behavior of this function R. So there's a function R, okay? It's just this function in the metric. It measures, if you want, the square root of the area of each point here, because points here are spheres upstairs. So by looking at the behavior of the function R, you can say more things about the geometry. So in particular, uh, I label this future null infinity script I plus, because this sort of boundary, which is coming from the ambient R2, uh, has the property that R goes to infinity as you approach it to the future. Okay? So this is so-called future null infinity. So it's a boundary that, in particular, this nice representation allows you to define and make sense of. And it, what it is, is the, if you want, it's the mathematical idealization of faraway observers in the radiation zone. Okay. And now the point is that uh, you can play the following game. You can say, what points in the space-time are visible to faraway observers in the radiation zone? Let's say, what points in the space-time have the property that if I go to the future in, let's say, in all direction, then I can meet an observer in the faraway radiation zone? Okay? So in Lorentzian geometry, uh, we say, what is the past the future null infinity? That's exactly the Lorentzian way of saying that. So if you think of null infinity having this component and also this component, which I forgot to label, then the past the future null infinity is everything south of this and south of that. Okay? So it's all of this. And there's something left. That's this darker shaded region here, B. That's the complement of the past the future. So these are the points in space-time that cannot send signals to future null infinity. That's to say they cannot communicate with faraway observers. So, uh, that defines in Lorentz and Jump the notion of black hole. Okay? So Schwarzschild has a black hole region. So remember, black hole region just has something to do with the global causal geometry of space time. Okay? And it's exactly this property. And well, once you're sort of used to these diagrams, you can read it off the diagram. May I ask you an ignorant question? What is the role of the white triangle down? Ah, so that is a dual, so there is a dual notion of past null infinity, which would be this and this, and you can look at the complement of the future of past null infinity, and that defines something which we call a white hole, and the region here is the white hole. Okay. Thank you. It's a good question. So, the notion of black hole per se is often said in the same breath as singularities. Okay? But there's nothing singular per se about what I just said. It's just some region which is uh, special in terms of the causal structure of space-time in view of the fact that you have a preferred notion of infinity. But there is a singularity in the Schwarzschild metric in the following sense. So there's some additional boundary, namely this horizontal line. But this boundary is not at infinity, like this was. So R does not go to infinity, for instance. R, in fact, goes to zero here in the limit. And moreover, this really is a finite boundary in the following sense. This space-time is geodesically incomplete, so there are time-like geodesics that go whoop, like that. And in finite time, they meet this boundary, so they only exist in the space-time for finite time. Uh, so it's really a finite boundary in that sense. Moreover, uh, this boundary is space-like. That's something that we can say because we have this ambient um, sort of structure, this ambient R2. And in fact, uh, more surprisingly, it's, it's actually upstairs, it's a space-like hypersurface, something which in some sense is, is suppressed here. And finally, this boundary is singular. Okay. So it's, it's singular, for instance, uh, very easy to say the forward, that the curvature blows up as you approach this boundary. Of course, not the Ricci curvature, the Ricci curvature is zero, but if you look at the Kretschmann scalar, which is a quadratic scalar invariant curvature, this blows up. But in fact, this boundary is even more singular than the curvature blowing up in L infinity. Um, microscopic observers are torn apart by infinite tidal forces as they approach this boundary. And uh, sort of a related statement that you can make is that uh, there not be an extension of this manifold beyond this boundary, 
even just requiring that the metric is continuous. Okay. So there is a black hole. Inside the black hole, there's a singularity. It's space-like, and it's very, very strong. That's Schwarzschild. OK, Schwarzschild seems interesting enough. But uh, general relativity is a bit more interesting. And this explicit solution, Schwarzschild, actually is but a one parameter subfamily of an even more complicated two parameter family of explicit solutions known as the Kerr family. So these were discovered much, much, much later, only in 1963. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, first of all, let me just give you, again, the metric in coordinates. Here it is. Uh, it's more difficult maybe to parse because there are all these symbols, but at the end of the day, you can. And it's complicated, but it's not infinitely complicated, and you know, everything here is sort of a polynomial and trigonometric expression. Okay? So it is what it is. But what you'll notice is that these solutions have far less symmetry. Okay? In particular, d by dt is still killing. Nothing depends on t. Uh, d by d phi is still killing. So it is axisymmetric. Nothing depends on phi, but you've lost the, the spherical. So there's only a two-dimensional Lie algebra of killing fields. And that's not enough to justify that there be explicit solutions of the Einstein vacuum. So the reason that this exists, in some sense, is very mysterious. There is a lot of hidden symmetry. And it's because of that hidden algebraic symmetry uh, that uh, you can find the solution. And that's why it took so long. To okay. So there it is. If you're really, really bored, you can check that this is indeed Ricci flat. That will take longer. But maybe you're fast. So it turns out that um, with the Kerr metric, just like in Schwarzschild, you can play the same game. Where should you define it? What is the correct sort of manifold on which to define it? And it turns out that, uh, again, you can identify a globally hyperbolic ambient manifold on which this naturally lives. And I'll uh, represent this schematically by a Penrose diagram. This Penrose diagram, for the experts, is just the, the domain, if you want, of, uh, of uh, the coordinates of a double null foliation. That's what I mean by it. But in any case, I can think of this as just a schematic picture. Remember, this space time is no longer spherically symmetric. Okay? So I can't sort of reduce things to two dimensional pictures. So here it is. Okay? And what you're meant to read off from this is the following. First of all, again, this is globally hyperbolic, and we'll get back to that later in the talk. So this will be a Cauchy hypersurface. And this will be its maximal development. Okay. So you can again think of this space time precisely in the context of Madame Chouquet's theorem as the globally maximal, um, globally hyperbolic development of initial data, which looks like that. Okay. Again, the data has two asymptotically flat ends, like in Schwarzschild. Again, there is this boundary at infinity, future null infinity, far away observers. Again, we can look at its past. Its past is everything south of that and south of that because there's another component here. That past has a complement, so it again has a black hole. Okay. But, of course, there's a difference. And the difference is the following. You see, this, this spacetime is again geodesically incomplete. So here is an observer whoop. He goes out of the spacetime in finite time because this boundary is not at infinity. But this boundary here is not space-like, it's null, and it's not singular. It's not singular at all. In fact, in fact the space-time can be extended beyond this boundary. So why then did I stop extending the space? Why, why, is, why, why is this the solution and not some bigger manifold where I've extended? Well, the reason is precisely that were I to extend beyond, let's say, to a point here, then the extension would not be globally hyperbolic. Because global hyperbolicity is precisely the property that ensures uniqueness for the initial value problem. And we all know from Loray that to hope to have uniqueness for the initial value problem, if I follow, a, let's say, a, a causal curve backwards from any point, I should go to the Cauchy surface. Because otherwise, there's no way that my solution will be, by domain of dependence property, uniquely determined. So you can just see by causality, if I had other points here, I could go backwards at 45 degrees, I would never find the Cauchy surface. So that's why <coughs> the sort of solution ends. It's not that there is a singularity. It's simply that um, if you extend it more, there would be no global hyperbolicity. So actually, this sort of um, 
boundary has a name, it's a so-called Cauchy horizon because it's a horizon for discussing the Cauchy problem. Okay, so that's, um, that's Kerr, and that's in some sense all we need to know for now about Kerr, and in some sense see later some other interesting aspects of Kerr. So now to the two main results or types of results that I'll talk about in the talk. So the uh, first one being the stability of the black hole extinct. Okay, so, well, the whole point of defining a general notion of dynamics is so that we can talk rationally about qualitative properties, for instance, the property of stability. And the prototype nonlinear stability result in general relativity is the monumental celebrated theorem of Christodoulou and Kleinerman uh, proving that flat space, the simplest solution of the einstein vacuum equations, is indeed dynamically stable. You wiggle the initial data that leads to flat space, that's to say Euclidean space, um, you take the maximum Cauchy development, does it look like Euclidean space, does it in fact, Minkowski space, sorry, does it in fact converge asymptotically in time back to Minkowski space? So you can think of the first question as that of orbital stability and the second as that of asymptotic stability and we all know from quasi-linear supercritical wave equations that in some sense you have to do both at the same time in order to do anything. So this is this monumental theorem. And this is really, in the asymptotically flat regime, the only uh, solution to the Einstein vacuum equations for which we know stability. So the analogous statement for the Schwarzschild and Kerr families remains a conjecture. Um, the conjecture is the following. Uh, well, briefly in words, that the subextremal Kerr family is stable in its exterior region as a solution to Cauchy problem. Uh, more uh, uh, explicitly, uh, if you think of the Kerr solution, so it makes more sense to draw the conjecture than to read what's written. If you think of this Kerr solution as the solution that came from its data, you wiggle its data, and the question is, these regions here, the lighter shaded regions, that's the black hole exterior, if you want. Uh, are these regions stable? That's to say, the solution you get from the wiggle data, does it still have regions that look like this? And moreover, as you approach this point, in this picture. That's really the question of, as you go, time goes to infinity when you're outside the black hole. Do you, again, uh, approach another member of the Kerr family? Okay? So that's what's written here. So uh, let me just make explicit a certain point. Uh, exactly because you need to prove asymptotic stability in order to prove any stability, it's very important that you look together at the Kerr family. You cannot just concentrate on the Schwarzschild family because if you just perturb Schwarzschild initial data, in particular, you may dynamically approach a nearby Kerr solution. Okay? So you really have to understand this problem in general um, around the curve. So I want to emphasize that this stability is only conjectured for the exterior regions, and I will say more about that. So some of the major difficulties in the above problem, you already see them at the linearized level, as we all expect from experience in PDEs, mathematical physics. And not surprisingly, in the physics literature, study of this problem goes way back to the uh, celebrated work of Reggie Wheeler from 1957, and there's a huge literature on this in the physics literature. An even easier problem than sort of the linearized Einstein equations is to consider what I'll call the poor man's linear problem. And the poor man's linear problem is simply understanding the scalar wave equation, box G, where G is the metric, the background metric, Schwarzschild the curve, box G C equals zero on these backgrounds. Okay? So why do I call this the poor man's linear equation? You should think of the equations you get when you linearize this, in some sense at least, if you linearize them naively, you'll get you know, a system such that the second order part always looks like this, but you have lots of very complicated uh, first order terms. So this poor man's linear problem has been sort of the seat of intense activity in the last few years, and many, many people have uh, contributed, uh, some of whom are even in this audience. Um, and as far as the asymptotically flawed case, the Kerr case is concerned, uh, this poor man's problem is uh, completely resolved. Now, in the full subextremal range of parameters, in some sense, getting this really for all Kerr parameters, remember Kerr is this two parameter family of solutions, uh, A and M, was a particular challenge. 
So the statement is simply that solutions of the wave equation, they remain bounded in these exterior regions, and in fact they decay polynomially. And in fact they decay polynomially at a suitably fast rate for the type of nonlinear applications. So another, uh, so this is a joint theorem with uh, Igor Rodnyansky and uh, Jakob schlappentorf -Roff. So I should add that very recently, the true linearized problem, not the poor man's, but the true linearized problem uh, is resolved, but only when you linearize around Schwarzschild. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Paul Seiko and Rodnyansky. I won't really talk much more about this today. So this is uh, an important step, but as I said, you really have to understand this in the, when you linearize around the whole curve family in order to move forward. So let me just give you some idea of some of the phenomena that enter in trying to prove this theorem, because as we'll see, they're very, very tightly uh, correlated with interesting geometric aspects of the black hole space terms themselves. And in some sense, the most important phenomena that enter uh, are the sort of celebrated phenomena of superradiance, the so-called redshift, and, and also uh, something familiar to people who've studied the obstacle problem, uh, trapped null geodesics. So superradiance, in some sense, uh, is the following. So if you look in Schwarzschild and you look at this vector d by dt, um, maybe I can even show it to you here. So you can see it here. If you look at d by dt, okay, then you can read off from the metric that d by dt has negative inner product with itself when r is bigger than 2m. Okay, that's something you can actually read off from the metric immediately. And r is bigger than 2m is precisely a characterization <coughs> of the exterior region. So uh, as a result, what does that tell you? That says that you can define a conserved quantity uh, with respect to d by dt, uh, which is non-negative definite. Okay, so it's coercive in the exterior of the black hole, except for one little thing, it degenerates on the horizon, because there, d by dt becomes a null vector. Okay. Again, you can read that off. So that means that it's easy enough to prove some version of boundedness just using sort of Noether's theorem. But now, if you look at Kerr, when a is not equal to 0, then d by dt becomes space-like in the exterior near this region, near the, let's just say, near where r equals 2 m. And again, let me, for reasons of time, not go back to the metric expression, but you can actually easily see this from the way I've written the metric. So in particular, you still have a conserved energy corresponding to d by dt, but it doesn't have a sign. And you should think that just because you call something d by dt does not mean that that has anything to do with time. Okay? And that's precisely the phenomenon here, that d by dt is not time-like everywhere outside the black hole. So this means that the energy identity is completely compatible with solutions growing exponentially. And if you want, uh, this is the phenomenon for waves of superradiance, which was first discussed by Zaldovsky. So even proving boundedness is difficult in the Kerr case because of this. So that's superradiance. Another phenomenon is the so-called redshift. So the redshift, uh, classically, you understand it simply as follows. You have two observers. So even in Schwarzschild, you could see this, A and B. So observers just means time-like geodesics. And observer A enters the black hole region, let's say. Observer B, uh, more conservative, does not. Okay. Observer A sends a signal to observer B at a constant frequency as observer A measures it. So look at the frequency that observer B receives this signal. This frequency is shifted infinitely to the red, that's to say the signal becomes more and more infrequent as B's time goes to infinity, exactly because this length is infinite, this length is finite. Okay. So this was actually first uh, understood by Oppenheimer Schneider in the prophetic paper. This is, a good ma this is a good property. It sort of means that there is a stability mechanism near horizons. Horizons want to be stable. But one thing I should mention is that the strength of this sort of redshift, it actually degenerates as this parameter A approaches M. And in fact, uh, in the case of equality, which is a special case of the Kerr metric, uh, this redshift factor at the horizon vanishes. And this leads to a certain instability, which uh, they now call in the physics literature the Aritaitis instability. And uh, in particular, the, the statement that I proved with um, 
Rodnyansky and Schlapp and Rothman for the sub-extremal case does not hold in the extremal case, and that's the theorem of, of Alec Deitch. So the final um, property which is important to know is the property of trap null geodesics. So it turns out that besides this funny event horizon, around the black hole, there are certain null geodesics that they're far from the horizon, or not too close in any case, but they just orbit the black hole. But they're not. These are not sort of time-like orbits. These are null orbits that orbit the black hole. So these are exactly the analog of trapped rays in the obstacle problem. And we all know that a single one of these, this is sort of an old result of Ralston in the, in the sort of classical context and in sort of the Lorentzian geometric context of Jan Zbierski, uh, a single one of these guys changes the nature of any dispersive statement. So if you have these guys, you have to understand them in order to do it. All right, so briefly put, the miracle of Kerr, which allows for our solution of the poor man's problem in the full sub-extremal range, is threefold. And the miracle is the following. There is a notion of frequency analysis that you can do. And through this notion, you can find that the superradiant part of the solution is not trapped. So the superradiant part of the solution does not see these trapped knowledge deficits. And this is essential for proving boundedness. So the second uh, important ingredient is that this <coughs> trap null even though they're there, they're unstable. So the dynamics of trapping is hyperbolic. This is essential for proving at least polynomial decay. And uh, to give a comparison, in the negative cosmological case, I won't go into that to this audience, but there's an analog of the current solution, and it's been proven by Holtzegel and Zimine PC and Garneau that you have logarithmic decay in this case and no better. And uh, finally, very, very important, is the absence of fixed frequency obstructions to boundaries. This property is very nice that I said here, but it really only tells you something about the high frequency regime. So who is to say that there isn't some exponentially growing mode solution? Uh, in fact, in the klein gordon case, for Kerr there is. So it can happen. There has to be a reason that it doesn't, and this was proven by Whiting and a certain refinement that was necessary by Schlafentorf. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the exterior because we all want to know the inside stuff. So let me review to you what we've said about uh, the interior black holes. So let's again compare Schwarzschild and Kerr spacetimes from the perspective of observers who <coughs> fall inside the black hole. Okay? So here's an observer who falls inside the black hole in Schwarzschild. And I told you before that this observer is torn apart by infinite tidal forces. Okay? And this is related to the fact, as I said, that this singularity is space-like and space-time is inextendable beyond that, even just as a Lorentzian math, if it's Caesar on that. What happened in Kerr? So here's the picture in Kerr. Here's observer gamma. Well, in principle, observer gamma reaches the boundary, and you could have extended this manifold further smoothly. It's a smooth metric. Okay? So observer gamma, in principle, can live another day in this extended space-time. So the only problem is we don't know what happens to gamma exactly because this extended space-time is not determined by initial data. So which of these two things is better, uh, this or that? If, if you're the observer, you probably think this is better because here you live another day in this extended space-time. In this case, you're torn apart by infinite tidal forces. That doesn't seem so great. But um, you see, for bureaucracy, uh, this is much, much better because everyone is accounted for. So if you don't go in the black hole, you live forever, great. We know exactly what happens to you. If you do go into the black hole, you're torn apart by infinite tidal forces. Whereas in this case, uh, if you go in the black hole, we don't know what happens. And physical theory is much like bureaucracy. So in particular, um, from the point of view of physical theory, this is something that we don't want our theory to have. And uh, we don't want it so much that Penrose conjectured that it doesn't happen generically. That's to say, uh, Kerr is a fluke, and if you look at generic vacuum asymptotic flat initial data, and you take the maximum Cauchy development, then that doesn't happen. In particular, the maximum development should be future and extendable as a suitably regular Lorentzian map. So I'll get back to this issue of suitable regular very, very soon. Uh, colloquially, you should, should just think as this, as the conjecture that generically the future is uniquely determined by the present. All right, so for the above conjecture to be true, 
the Kerr solution in particular must be unstable in the black hole interior. So why would you ever think that aside from wish, wishful thinking? Well, there is a reason, and it's precisely dual to the redshift that I talked about just a second ago. This is the celebrated blue shift. So now you have two observers A and B. I've switched their names. So observer A is now the conservative one, stays outside the black hole, lives for all time. Observer B is the more revolutionary one, goes into the black hole, and in finite time reaches this Cauchy horizon. And if you look at the signal that observer A sends to observer B, then if this is sent at constant frequency, the frequency that B measures the signal is infinitely shifted to the blue as B's crossing time approaches. Okay? That's to say that the frequency gets more and more frequent, infinitely more frequent. So you can think of this at the geometric optics level as an instability mechanism. So this suggests in particular that once you have a wave-like dynamic degree of freedom, and after all, the full nonlinear dynamics of the Einstein equations, they, when you linearize, they have wave-like degrees of freedom, that should pick up this effect and cause some sort of instability. Moreover, um, of course, a linear equation, at worst, it can blow up asymptotically. Linear equations on globally hypermold manifolds cannot blow up in finite time. But you might reasonably think that because the Einstein equations are nonlinear, once nonlinearities start to kick in, uh, then this would make you have what is more the analog of finite time blow up. That's to say, blow up at the space like hypersurface before you reach this sort of no boundary, which is as far as you could go in the globally hyperbolic domain. So a natural working hypothesis was that for generic dynamic solutions of the Einstein equations, the picture would revert to Schwarzschild. So even though Schwarzschild is non-generic in the Kerr family, it is generic in the sense in the family of sort of general solutions of the initial value. So this motivates what, for the purpose of this talk, I'll call very strong cosmic censorship. And very strong cosmic censorship says precisely that for generic uh, initial data for the Einstein vacuum equations, the maximal Cauchy development is inextensible, just like Schwarzschild was. That's to say it has a space-like singularity in some natural sense, and you cannot extend beyond even as a continuous map. So there's been a lot of debate in the literature as to whether you should expect very strong cosmic censorship to be true. So on the one hand, there is an even more, in some sense, ambitious conjecture in the physics literature. In physics, there's no lack of ambitious conjectures, don't <laughs> speak else. And this claims to describe precisely the profile of generic singularities, but very precisely the profile of what you see. And sort of part zero of that conjecture, in some sense, uh, of course, conjectures, the way they're given in the physics literature, are always uh, open to interpretation. Uh, in some sense postulates that they are indeed space-like and the above strong form is true. So in any case, people have uh, routinely said that this should be true on the basis of their understanding of whatever this means. On the other hand, there, there was a spreading symmetric toy model, uh, originally due to Israel and Poisson, various people worked on, including myself way back in my thesis actually. And in this toy model, something different happens, something funny. So in this toy model, uh, of course, it's a very, very special model, but in any case, what you saw generically in the context of the toy model was that you'd always have this null boundary, at least a piece of it. So it wasn't at all like Schwarzschild, it wasn't space-like, but the null boundary itself was singular. But it wasn't singular in the way that Schwarzschild was singular, it was singular in a, in a weaker sense. So it was still the case that uh, the Christoffel symbols were not square integrable, but you could extend the metric continuously beyond. Okay. So I'll finish the talk by announcing a theorem, which is joined with Jonathan Luke, now of Cambridge US, in a month of Cambridge UK, which when combined with a hopefully future resolution of the stability conjecture of the exterior, resolves this debate definitively for the Einstein vacuum equations without such. So uh, the theorem is simply the following. I'll have to sort of draw it with my arms. So if you consider characteristic initial value problem for the Einstein vacuum equations with data like this, okay, where these are two null hypersurfaces, so that's why I'm drawing it like a V, such that the data as you go this way and as you go that way 
converges to a curve solution at an appropriately fast rate, consistent with what stability of the exterior supposedly tells us. So consider this characteristic data, okay? And now solve the characteristic initial value problem to the future. The statement is that the maximal Cauchy development has a boundary that looks like this. That's to say, has a boundary uh, which consists of a bifurcate null cone across which you can still extend continuously the matter. So a corollary of this statement is the following. If the stability of Kerr is true, that's to say, if these horizons look like what we think, then the Penrose diagram of the interior is also stable. In particular, the boundary is completely null. And moreover, you can still extend beyond continuously. So there's no symmetry in this theorem. This is a completely general result. So in particular, the strong, the very strong cosmic censorship conjecture is, is false. So this is the last slide. Um, so let me just say the following. There's a revised version of strong cosmic censorship, a weaker version if you want, that still may be true. And this version is, in fact, due to the Mithrasatolu. And the conjecture says that, uh, well, OK, you have this Cauchy horizon, maybe. And you can extend maybe the metric continuously, but you cannot extend so that the Christoffel symbols are square integrable. And this would mean that at least you cannot extend as a weak solution of the Einstein equations, and that would have physical significance. And in some sense, it's reasonable to make this conjecture because the existence of local patches of space time that have this property uh, was proven in the breakthrough work of Jonathan Luke that actually led to this theory. So I'm very hopeful that this conjecture can be proven, and the first step would be to prove it in a neighborhood of the curve. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for this beautiful lecture. And as before, we go for the easy part, which is giving oh. you this present in the name of the organizing committee. Thank you very much. And next talk. We are free to shoot on him and send him to a black hole. <laughs> Let it be a curved black hole. At uh, least. Okay. <laughs> An exactly curved black hole. So, let me ask you, I mean, I'm very ignorant, but let me ask you questions. So, forgive me for my ignorance. The solutions, the Schwarzschilds and the care, converge to flat uh, Bikovsky. <coughs> as you go, if you want, uh, yeah. as you go this way. And all of these things that you, is this a general fact? Yes, the, these solutions, as you go towards infinity, where time is zero, let's say, they converge to flat space. That's what uh, it means. So to say it another way, they arise from initial data, which is asymptotically flat, oh. which means that the spatial slice, as you go out to infinity, looks like flat space, the geology. The exactly. next question is that uh, so Schwarzschilds, which is what we knew all the time, they don't have a, uh, a, 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 a spherical component. And the, the, the curve have another parameter and they have a sine and cosine term. Yes. Is there an interpretation in terms of rotation turbulence? Yes. Yeah, so, so the curve solution, the interpretation is that this is a rotating black hole and this uh, Parameter A is a measure of uh, rotation. And so A times M is the angular momentum. And does it make then, uh, is this an explanation that they are a bit more stable? Well, they're a bit more stable, right, you're saying. Uh, they are a bit more stable, in fact. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, yes, it is in the sense that, okay, the one that is exactly non rotating is, okay. that is. Okay. Are there any questions from the public? <laughs> Okay, I have a last question. Uh, Since I am in PDEs, uh, you say that the, the, the toy model was solving the wave equation. And then. Yeah, the, yeah. the poor model. And then the, the real problem is complicated. Model. Is there a substantial difference in the difficulty of the problem? Yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, there, is, there are certain issues that you understand very in all these problems. The toy the various toy models were very helpful. There were certain issues that you could really understand at the level of the toy model, 
But of course, there are other difficulties that are completely absent in the toy model. In particular, if the toy models are linear, uh, these equations, the full equations are nonlinear. Uh, you know, there are some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, thanks, speaker.